Welcome back. In this video, I wanted to spend some time talking about how information is handled in cells, and in particular, how cells store and recover information. So information is stored in cells in long molecules or polymers called deoxyribonucleic acid. And since it's a polymer, that means it's made up of fundamental units. And these units are called nucleotides. Each nucleotide has a phosphate group attached to it, a sugar, and then one of four base bases, nitrogenous basins, thymine, adenine, cytosine, or guanine. And depending on the type of molecule, the particular base, uh, this molecule will attach here to this atom on the sugar molecule. So there are four types of nitrogenous bases in DNA. There is no T in RNA, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. So there's A, G, A, G, C, and T. Those are the four options. So those are the polymer units. The polymer units then get assembled into long chains, and this is a picture of what that looks like. So if you zoom into DNA, you might see something like this, and there's a couple of things to notice here. First, the actual nitrogenous, the base pairs, are linked together with the phosphate groups. So phosphate groups bind to the sugar molecule, which then bind to a phosphate group, which then bind to a sugar molecule. And again, you have the nitrogenous bases attached to the sugar molecule. So here's thymine and here's guanine. This represents one half of the DNA strand. And these are the base pairs on this side, a T and a G. Now DNA is a unique molecule because it's double-stranded, which means that there's another strand on the other side, also with a phosphate sugar backbone and with its own sequence of base pairs. But the thing is, the sequence of the base pairs is always complementary. Adenine has a place to form two hydrogen bonds with two complementary locations on thymine. So adenine will always bind with thymine. Likewise, guanine has three locations for hydrogen bonding. So guanine will always hydrogen bond with cytosine. So if we zoom out a little bit further, this is what the DNA molecule actually would look like. <clears throat> DNA forms a double helix structure, and adenine always binds with thymine, so red and orange always go together, and blue and green, guanine and cytosine, always go together. What this means is that if you know one strand sequence, you automatically know the other strand sequence because there is always complementary base pairing between the base pairs. A always binds with G, with T, and C always binds with G. All right, so these are the two points to remember. DNA is double-stranded and this complementary base pair strategy. All right, okay, so that's, that's how base pairs are stored in DNA, but what does that mean exactly? What, how is this used, and what does this have to do with information? Well, it's, it's similar to information management in computer systems in the following way. So here's a string of binary numbers that might represent some computer code. So at the most basic level in a computer, it's essentially analyzing a series of ones and zeros. And from these ones and zeros, it gets instructions. So what kind of instructions to perform in the processor? And it also can get data. So for instance, this string of ones and zeros, when translated by the computer, might tell the computer to move certain numbers into certain memory locations within the RAM. And it does this over and over and creates the, the programs we see and interact with every day. In DNA, there's a similar thing happening, although at a biological level. This is what a string of DNA actually looks like. And this DNA actually encodes the instructions to create the insulin molecule that's necessary to keep us healthy and to properly regulate blood sugar. So you'll notice it's similar to computer code in that it's a sequence of four possible letters. Here I have one or zero. Here I have one of four possible letters. So it's a base four number system instead of a base two number system. And just like with computer code, 
DNA contains start and stop regions that tell the cell where to start reading and to stop reading, and it also includes instructions on how to modify the DNA as it gets turned into uh, proteins, which is how things are done in the cell. So this is, this is the parallel between information between DNA and computer code, but how do things actually get done in the cell? Just as a side note here, um, every human cell contains 3.3 billion base pairs. I should say every cell with a nucleus. So that means everything but blood, red blood cells within your body contains 3.3 billion of these letters in, in the form of a DNA molecule. And this is a really fascinating thing because it means every single cell with a nucleus that is in your body has all of the instructions to make any other part of your body. So as a particular example, if you were to scrape a skin cell off of your hand or your foot, that skin cell actually has all of the instructions necessary to become a muscle cell or a bone cell or a, a corneal cell for your eye. Right? It's just that those instructions are never read. So a good analogy is to think of DNA as sort of a biological cookbook on how to make a human. And different cell types have their own recipes that they read. So certain cell types make pastry recipes only. Other cell types make meatloaf recipes only. And all of these cells, by reading their own recipes, make all of the different cell types in the body. And these different cell types then work together to form a functional organism. Right? So how are things actually done inside the cell? How is this information actually used? Well, the way a cell converts DNA into action is that it uses the DNA instructions to create a special kind of molecule called proteins. So proteins are actually also polymers, but they are polymers of amino acids instead of nucleotides. So proteins are sort of like these pearl necklaces where each circle represents an amino acid and there are 20 different amino acids. So proteins are these long strands and then they conform into unique and often very complex three-dimensional shapes. And the shape of a protein is very important. The shape is what gives the protein its function. And so the whole point of DNA is to contain the instructions that tell the cell how to make proteins, a variety of proteins. And there, there are only 20 amino acids. Every living thing on planet Earth uses the same 20 amino acids to create things. Spider silk, for instance, is made of certain amino acids from this table. So is insulin. So is the, the <clears throat> proteins found in milk that you drink every morning. So what are some other examples of proteins? Proteins are used to create the scaffolding that gives cells their shape, that is the cytoskeleton. So they create the framework, the molecular level framework that gives cells their shape. Proteins are also used to create enzymes, and enzymes make certain chemical reactions possible. So in effect, proteins allow the cell to switch chemical reactions off and on based on its environment, based on its current needs. Proteins are also used to signal or to talk to other cell types. So cells often make proteins and then secrete them outside the cell where they can travel off to some other location in the body and communicate with other cell types. And lastly, proteins are used to create the molecular motors that make muscle contraction possible. So a very real way to think about proteins are nanoscale actuators. And these actuators then go off to perform a variety of functions. So proteins, in effect, do all the work in the cell. That's how everything gets done, is by proteins. So we've seen how DNA is similar to computer code, and we know that DNA can be used to make proteins, but the missing piece is how exactly does that happen? And that's what I wanted to show you next. So how do we get from proteins to DNA? Well, this is known as the central dogma of biology. The basic workflow is this. DNA contains the instructions in a series of letters, A, C, G, and T. DNA undergoes a process called transcription, where it's turned into what is known as messenger RNA. 
messenger RNA is sort of like a temporary form of DNA. So consider this sort of a scratch pad that you use to write down instructions on before you print the final copy. mRNA is very similar to DNA. It's made up of four letters as well, A, C, G, and U, or uracil, instead of T. So mRNA is almost the exact same thing with one slight change as DNA. mRNA then undergoes a process known as translation, which produces the final protein molecule. So this is the central dogma of biology, and there is a lot of information here. This is only a very brief and broad overview of the general process. So let's take a look at each step real quick, going from DNA to mRNA, how that works. So transcription works like this. Say I'm given a DNA sequence of double-stranded DNA, and this is, this is um, stretched out here and shown for clarity. <clears throat> and again, this is, a, this is the start of the molecule insulin. Right? So we have two strands of DNA. They are complementary. That is, wherever there is a T, there is an A, and wherever there is a C, there is a G. And this DNA is normally wound tight as a helix, but before it can undergo transcription, it has to get unwound. So there are molecules present, proteins, in the cell that assist in unwinding the DNA. And so after you unwind the DNA, what you then want to do is split it open, or unzip it, if you will. So we get to, whoops, let me spell that correctly. So we want to split open the DNA into a single strand. So this is one of the two strands. After you split open the DNA, we want to make an mRNA copy of the, the, um, the DNA. So this is still a single strand of DNA. And after it's split open, cellular machinery comes along and makes an mRNA copy of it. So you'll see that where there is a T on the DNA, there is an A in the RNA. But where there is an A in the DNA, there is a U in the mRNA. And so this is, this is my transcribed sequence of the mRNA. Now, the next step is then translation. How do we go from the mRNA sequence to protein? Well, the way we do that is we use um, the process translation and, we can, and the cell, cellular machinery to convert these into um, proteins. This table summarizes the pattern. So when converting mRNA into proteins, there's a, it goes by every three letters, what is known as a triplet. So every three letters of the mRNA are read by a molecular head, and that molecular head then converts the three letters into the appropriate protein. So the appropriate protein, if we start here, the first protein is AUG, then the next triplet is GCC, and so on. AUG is what is known as the start codon, and this tells the molecular machinery to start reading here. So it's very similar to a start statement in a computer pro like programming language. So the molecular machinery comes along and starts translating this information until it gets to the end, and as you can see there are also stop codons triplet or codon is what these are called. And so once it gets to the stop codon, it stops translating, translating the molecule. So if I take my sequence here and translate it, this is my protein sequence. And each one of these represents, represents one of the original 20 amino, uh, amino acids that I showed you in the table earlier. Met is methionine, alanine, leucine, tryptophan, and so on. And ultimately, this, this long chain of amino acids would wrap up into a three-dimensional shape and be ready for action outside of the cell to go perform some function. And that, in a very brief nutshell, is how information is stored and retrieved inside the cell.